Nestled on the secluded Norwegian island of Spitsbergen, the Spalbird Global Seed Vault is known as one of the world's most secure rooms built within a mountain, surrounded by permafrost and equipped with multiple layers of security systems, including blast-proof doors, motion sensors, and surveillance cameras. This facility safeguards a vast collection of plant seeds from around the world. This monumental structure, masterfully engineered and crafted, fulfills a crucial mission. And that mission is protect the genetic diversity of plant species from all over the world. Uh, this vault is known as a, a sanctuary for seeds. And uh, I would encourage you to check that facility out. You can go online. You can look that up. There are pictures there. Um, you can go on YouTube where there are videos uh, posted of people going into this vault. Uh, but uh, that vault isn't open to the public. You can't just walk in there. Uh, it's, a, it's a sealed vault. Um, but uh, on their website, I noticed there was a slogan, and the slogan was safeguarding seeds for the future. Safeguarding seeds for the future. Kind of, it almost reminded me of a, a sci-fi movie. Um, it, it's kind of brought me to that, but uh, I couldn't pass up on that opportunity to share that with you as I consider, consider the next ministry of the Holy Spirit within uh, this church age of grace. Today in our time together, we're going to be studying the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. And as I thought about those seeds locked away in that vault, my mind went to this particular ministry of the Holy Spirit. If you were to travel to that island today, none of you have the clearance to be able to, to walk into the vault for the purpose of using up some of those seeds. Uh, those seeds are organized, those seeds are locked up, and those seeds have been permanently locked away from the outside world. In all reality, when it comes to it, those seeds located in the Svalbard uh, Global Seed Vault are secure in that vault. Which brings us to our main truth that we're going to see in our time together this morning. And that truth is that through the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, believers find their ultimate security in Christ. Through the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, believers find their ultimate security in Christ. Merrill Unger actually commented on all these works of the Holy Spirit that we have studied except for the baptism of the Spirit, which we will begin to cover in our next lesson. Uh, but I love what he says. He writes this, that by regeneration, he gives us his own very life. By the Spirit's baptism, he unites us to himself. Through the indwelling, he grants us his continual presence. And by the sealing, he stamps us as his very own for all eternity. That's what we're going to be looking at today, the sealing ministry. This is a special work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer, when it is studied and understood, it helps us to see that our salvation in Christ is eternal and it is secure. Now, the Holy Spirit serves as a divine seal, affirming God's ownership and possession of his people. It represents his unmistakable mark and declaration of our belongingness to him. I was someone recently that understanding biblical doctrine is sort of like, like a grid, if you will. If someone says, well, you can lose your salvation, not only is that an attack on soteriology, the, the study of salvation, but that's also an attack on pneumatology, what we're studying this morning, the study of the Holy Spirit. And the reason why I say that is because of this work right here, the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. So my goal is, as we work our way through this today, the sealing ministry from the Scripture that we will have a, a better understanding into this ministry. Remember, we're drawing our conclusions today strictly from the Word of God. We believe that all of Scripture is inspired by God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Now, in our last lesson, we studied the work of regeneration. And in that lesson, there were five significant assessments made that were applied to these particular works of the Spirit. And those five significant assessments were also applied to the work of the Holy Spirit that we are studying today. According to the assessments provided in that last lesson, these works are primarily concentrated around the time of a, a person's salvation. We, we've already studied the indwelling, 
the regenerating, today the sealing, and then we're going to be uh, uh, looking at the baptism ministries of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and uh, they are unique and unrepeatable, occurring only once in a believer's life. These works establish eternal life for the believer and cannot be undone, so the idea of losing your salvation is therefore considered unbiblical and an affront to the doctrine of salvation and the work of the Holy Spirit, which is what we will see. So with that being said in our time together, we're going to carefully observe from the Word of God five facts about the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Five facts uh, about the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit that will help us to understand this ministry that the Holy Spirit has to a greater t degree. And that brings us to the first fact that we're going to consider in our time together. And that first fact is that the ministry of, is that this ministry, the sealing ministry of the Spirit, is found in the New Testament. We find this ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. The Greek word for seal is sphlagizo, and it's been used 15 times in the New Testament. For instance, Pilate, he ordered the tomb of Jesus Christ to be sealed up. Well, do you remember why he had the tomb of Jesus Christ sealed? It was because they were concerned that the, the disciples of Jesus Christ would go in, would steal the body of Jesus Christ, and so uh, they had that tomb sealed up. In Matthew 27, verse 66, we read, And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. There's that Greek word, splagizo. So in Matthew 27, 66, the seal was a physical seal that was placed on the tomb of Jesus Christ. But there's another seal that we find in the New Testament. And this seal that we are studying today, it's very real. It's invisible. Uh, but it's for the believer in Christ. And I was... Um, I was able to look at every New Testament usage of this Greek word, and I found that there are three main texts, three main passages where we find the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit in the New Testament. And so we're going to uh, look at those real briefly here. The first one's in Ephesians. If you turn there with me in your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, we're going to spend most of our time here, but I want to mention the other uh, passages as well. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. Um, would like to ask that you turn there with me. I've also got it up here on the PowerPoint. But in the New Testament, you've got Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 says, In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. So the Apostle Paul, is informing those believers who are in Ephesus that they were sealed in Christ with the Holy Spirit after they responded to the message of the gospel through faith. Now the second main text that we find is found in 2 Corinthians. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 21 through 22, where we read, Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us as God who also sealed us and gave us the Spirit in our hearts as a pledge. Again, this is very clearly a work of the Spirit in the life of the believer, which leads us to the third main text. And that third main text for the sealing of the Holy Spirit can be found in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30. And in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, we read, we read, Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed, for the day of redemption. And as we track along in this series on pneumatology, we're going to be in and out of that verse as well, but um, uh, not, not so much today. But we do find the sealing ministry. Now, the sealing that the Apostle Paul specifically mentions in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 22, 21 through 22, and in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, carries the specific idea that means, here's the meaning of this word, it means to mark with a seal as a means of identification, mark or seal. And that's a big deal for those who would receive this mark. Dwight Pentecost makes a great observation here. I love what he says. When we approach the throne of grace, it is not in our own merit or right, but in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. By giving to us the seal of the Spirit, God has given to us the rights privileges, authority, and responsibility that belong to the child of God. Just 
as the Swabird Global Seed Vault securely preserves those seeds and have, have sealed those seeds away, the New Testament attests to the existence of individuals who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. And these individuals possess divine rights and privileges bestowed by God, setting them apart from those who do not share in those blessings. Some have authority and responsibility exclusive to children of God, while others lack these attributes due to, due to their rejection of Jesus Christ. Consequently, I pose the question, who are these individuals mentioned? Who are these individuals possessing such rights, privileges, authority, and responsibilities in life? Who is sealed with the Spirit of God? Well, that brings us to our second fact this morning. And in our second fact, we find that all believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit in this church age of grace. Now, when you look at these three main passages that deal with the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, it becomes obvious to us that this ministry is exclusively for believers in this church age of grace. Walver, it is quick to point out here that every reference to sealing contemplates it as a finished act dependent only upon saving faith. Every Christian accordingly can receive by faith the fact of the indwelling spirit as God's seal, setting him apart to eternal redemption. This is again evident when you study the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit. Now, universalism. Universalism is this belief that every person will be reconciled to God and will have a place in heaven. That's what universalism is. But we can clearly see that that's not the case. It's not the case that everyone will be reconciled to God because of this fact right here, this sealing of the Spirit. Within the main passages that deal with the uh, sealing of the Spirit, each of those verses are written to the believer in Christ, and the sealing ministry is connected to the believer in Christ. This ministry isn't connected. The sealing ministry is not connected at all in the New Testament to the unbeliever. Not once do we find in the New Testament the Holy Spirit sealing an unbeliever. It's not there. Or someone who has rejected Jesus Christ. You won't find it. This idea that we are all God's children is a satanic lie. And you'll notice with me this progression of events. If you would turn back there with me to Ephesians chapter 1. I said we're going to spend most of our time here. We're going to park here today. I love this verse. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In the context here, Paul isn't writing to everyone in the city of Ephesus. He isn't writing to the religious elite or to the city's politicians. No, Paul is writing to a group of believers. He's writing to saints, those who have placed their faith in Jesus Christ. He writes in verse 1, and he says in verse 1 of chapter 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus, and who are faithful in Jesus Christ. He's not writing to the world. He's not writing to the unsaved. He's writing to saints. It's with me the progression of events that leads to the sealing of the Spirit in the lives of these believers. First, Paul writes, In him you also, and he's referring specifically to believers, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, so the first step toward being sealed with the Spirit of God is right here. They heard the gospel. That was the first step. That leads us into our second step. Paul writes, having also believed. So Paul is essentially writing to those who have responded to the gospel. The gospel of God's grace is not just good advice to be obeyed. It's good news to be believed. They heard. They responded. Then notice what transpired next. They were sealed. Paul says, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. You were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. This sealing isn't for everybody. This sealing is specifically for those who have responded to the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, through faith in Christ. When we had our monthly outreach event um, over the school year, uh, Engage, our high school students, those uh, teenagers who are part of our SLS study group, were given T-shirts that they could wear during our Engage Outreach event here at the church. And uh, we decided that they would have those T-shirts. Um, they would say student leader on them, and, and those T-shirts would be 
in the color blue. Well, that was, uh, those blue t-shirts were a mark of identification. We didn't give these student leader t-shirts out to everybody at Engage, only to those who were serving behind the scenes and had applied themselves through our SLS study group. Now, granted, what we have here in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, it's so much greater. What we have here, what we're looking at, is much greater than a t-shirt, okay? But that uh, illustration, I think, is necessary. It serves its purpose. Paul writes to these believers who've heard the gospel, who have responded to the gospel through faith, and he says that they were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise. For sealed with who? With Christ. What this sealing does is it marks off God's people as his own possession. It means that the believer is a genuine, identifiable member of the family of God and is the property. So when other churches and other um, teens came into this place at an engage, they weren't wondering who the student leaders were. They knew who they were based, based upon those t-shirts that they had. In the same way, God knows who belongs to him. The Lord sees, he knows those who don't know him, who have rejected the gospel, and he knows those who belong to him. The Lord sees all that. He knows all that. Now, what sticks out in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, is this description given of the Holy Spirit. He is referring, here, he is referring to here, and you'll notice, the Holy Spirit of what? The Holy Spirit of promise. You'll note that. The Holy Spirit of promise. He's given this title because of the nature of his work. This sealing ministry it doesn't happen by chance. It doesn't happen by fate. It doesn't happen by coincidence. The Holy Spirit was given this title because he was promised by Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, while on this earth, promised that the Holy Spirit was going to come. He promised. He made that promise. That promise was kept. That promise was fulfilled, literally. When Jesus was on this earth, in John chapter 14, verse 17, he said that the world cannot receive him. And the world cannot receive him because of two factors. The world has either not heard the gospel, one. There are individuals who have never heard the gospel before. There are others who've heard and they've just rejected the gospel. They, they hear, hear it time and time again from various people that God places in their life and they continue to reject the gospel of Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ made that promise. You find that promise in John chapter 14, verses 6 through 17. John chapter 14, verse 26, as well as in John chapter 16, verses 7 through 14. So to dismiss this work of the Spirit is to dismiss the promises of Jesus Christ involving the Holy Spirit in this church age of grace. Unlike a t-shirt, you can't feel the sealing. You can't feel it. You can't feel the sealing of the Spirit, nor can you take it off. That sealing of the Spirit is an event. Pastor David Thompson says it so well. He, he stated here, the very moment a person hears the gospel and believes on Jesus Christ, that person is forever sealed with the Holy Spirit until the day of redemption. This means the transaction is final. This is not something we feel or even sense. We are not aware this is even happening, but this is a theological reality. When you dive into the Greek, you're going to discover from a grammatical perspective that there are some rich theological truths taking place here, and I want to look at those, some of those in our time together. This hearing of the gospel... Believing the gospel and receiving this seal are all in, in, in the Greek. If you parse those Greek phrases out in, first, uh, in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, you're going to find that those Greek words are in the aorist tense. And what this means is that all of these things are taking place at the same time. The salvation that was received by the group that Paul addressed in this letter was a historical fact to be believed. It was an event that happened. They were sealed. That was a single moment in time. They were sealed with the Spirit of God. And it happened at salvation. So the question then is this. What is the day of redemption? In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, Bible Knowledge Commentary refers to the day of redemption as a time 
that a believer receives his or her new body. And of course, this is clear from the context of Ephesians chapter 1, verse 14, as well as in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 20 through 21. So this work of the Spirit, simply put, is unique to this age, to this church age of grace. Uh, the details regarding the continuation of the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit after our arrival in heaven are not explicitly mentioned. However, the sealing ministry provides every believer with the assurance that they will ultimately reach their heavenly destination. And it serves as a guarantee of the believer's secure journey towards eternal life in heaven. You will not find a verse like this one, Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, in the Old Testament. Which brings us to our third fact, <coughs> and that third fact concerning the sealing ministry is that this ministry is clearly and completely a work of God. Now what I stated earlier was that when you dive into the Greek, you'll come up with some rich theological truth. And this is, this is a rich verse. I love this verse. Ephesians 1.13, powerful verse. I want to put Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 back up on the PowerPoint as we work our way through this, because we're going to dive into the Greek here, okay? And uh, as we've already noted within this verse, the hearing, believing, and sealing of the Holy Spirit was in the aorist tense. This signified the reality that all believers are sealed with the Holy Spirit in this church age of grace, but what we also find in the, in the Greek is that there are active and passive forms found within the process of one being sealed. So if you, are to, if you were to parse out the Greek here, these Greek words, you would discover that both listening and believe, they are in the active form. And I have those highlighted for you on this point, but notice the word sealed is not in the active form. What, what form is that taking? It's taking a passive form. I want us to note that. It's taking a passive form form. The believers in Ephesus had actively listened to the gospel. They weren't falling asleep when the gospel was being proclaimed to them. They were listening. They were um, considering what was being said. They were, they were actively involved in that, and they made a decision. They trusted Christ. That was uh, an active aspect of that. They heard the gospel, and they responded to it. But you'll notice there that sealing is in the passive form which it is found in the Greek for sealed. It indicates the fact that God is the one who initiates the sealing action of the Holy Spirit. The believing sinner had no direct involvement in the process of being sealed. That's what this shows us. The only active role that the sinner has lies in hearing and believing the truth of the gospel. So grammatically speaking, Paul did not... Uh, play a part in the sealing of these believers. He didn't do that. Paul didn't seal them. And the believers themselves, they didn't play a part. There wasn't something that they had to do. They weren't chasing after it. They weren't seeking out the sealing of the Holy Spirit. That wasn't it at all. God sealed them. It was an act of God. And it's why John Wavard would declare the seal is provided as the token of what will be brought to its conclusion at the day of redemption. Well, who has provided this seal? Was it the Apostle Paul? Was it that believing remnant in Ephesus? Or was it God himself? The Greek, Greek emphatically declares that God is the one responsible for providing this seal as a token for the believer at that moment of salvation. And at the moment of trusting Christ, at that moment, you are placed into the family of God and sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. And by the way, if you do a study on Ephesians chapter 1, Paul is making a case here for the riches that we have in Christ. We are rich. If you know Christ, you're richer than Bill Gates today. I just want you to know that. And this is one of those riches. You've been sealed with the Spirit of God. You just read right through chapter 1. You've had a discouraging week this week. Read this chapter. It'll encourage you. It's a powerful passage. But that brings us to our fourth fact concerning this work of the spirit of promise within this fourth fact, and that is the picture of a seal is impactful. In Jeremiah chapter 32, verses 9 and 10, Jeremiah purchased a piece of land. In those verses, Jeremiah says, 
I bought the field, which was at Anathoth from Hanamel, my uncle's son, and I weighed out the silver for him, 17 shekels of silver. I signed and sealed the deed and called in witnesses and weighed out the silver on the scales. From those, these two verses, a seal signifies a finished transaction, not a, a purchase, purchase that is pending. It's a done deal. Zero strings are attached to it. Jeremiah then went on to describe how his relationship with that piece of property had changed. In verses 11 and 12, we read, Then I took the deeds of purchase, both the sealed copy containing the terms and conditions, and the open copy, and I gave the deed of purchase to Baruch, in the sight of Hanamel, my uncle's son, and in the sight of all the witnesses who signed the deed of purchase, before all the Jews who were sitting in the court of the guard. When Jeremiah purchased this land, he became the rightful owner of it. In fact, a seal would not only signify a finished transaction, but based off of verses 11 and 12 here, it would also signify ownership. Then in the book of Esther, you'll find that a seal would also signify security. In Esther chapter 8, verse 8, we read, Now you write to the Jews as you see fit in the king's name and seal it with the king's signet ring for a decree which is written in the name of the king and sealed with the king's signet ring may not be revoked. So this sealing had been the ultimate picture to describe that which was secure. Once more, a seal serves as a symbolic representation of a completed transaction, ownership, and security. As believers in Christ, those who have been sealed by the Holy Spirit of promise, the sealing process was initiated by God upon our saving faith in Christ and reached its culmination as a finished transaction. Therefore, our salvation stands as a definitive and irrevocable reality, a completed transaction. Our salvation, it is comprehensive for we have acquired a new master and now belong to another. Further, our salvation is secure. Brother, sister in Christ, don't let anyone tell you differently. Is it any wonder why the Apostle Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 5.17, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. These pictures of a seal are impactful for the believer in Jesus Christ. Well, that leads us to our fifth fact, and that is this ministry has powerful repercussions for the believer. John Walford gets it right, I believe, when he says that the point of greatest significance in the sealing of the Holy Spirit is the eternal security of the believer. It is plainly stated that the seal is placed on the Christian with a view to keeping him safe unto the day of redemption. The matter is not left in human hands, but is dependent entirely on the power of God. You and I don't need to walk away from this lesson looking for some kind of external, unusual experience that might confirm the Spirit's sealing in our lives, nor do we need to pray for the Spirit's sealing. This is a work that He does in our life the moment we hear the gospel and believe it for salvation. In fact, what I have found is that typically, if someone questions the concept of eternal security, what is true of them is that they typically lack knowledge regarding the nature and the role of the Holy Spirit. It is highly likely that an individual who denies the biblical teaching of eternal security has never delved deeply into the study of pneumatology. The ministry of the Holy Spirit, independent of other aspects such as regeneration, indwelling, or baptism, unequivocally assures the believer that they are sealed in this life. You and I who know Christ, this ministry, it has powerful repercussions. Now, perhaps you're here today or you're listening online and you're unsure about things in your life. I would encourage you to be sure about this, where you'll spend eternity. The scripture makes it very clear. We've all sinned. We have fallen short of God's perfection. He's holy and he cannot be in the presence of sin and the wages of sin is death. There's nothing I can do, nothing that you can do to make yourself right with God, which is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live a perfect life, to die on the cross for the sin of the world, to rise again from the dead three days later, and he offers life to any who will believe in him. If, you would, if you've never made that decision, make that decision today. That is the good news that these believers uh, heard in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, that they heard while in Ephesus 
they heard that message, they responded to that message in faith, and then they were sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13, the gospel has been described as the message of truth. I don't want to skip over this. Any message that steers away from God's grace alone through faith alone and Christ alone is a false message. Any message that says that all people are going to heaven, that's a false message. That's a demonic message. Any message that says that you need to do something in and of yourself, in your own strength, to be right with God, that is a false message. There's only one message of truth, and when it comes to your salvation and my salvation, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9, for by the grace of God you have been saved through faith. Not of anything that you have done, it is the gift of God. God is offering that free gift. Uh, will you take that in faith by placing your faith in Christ? Make that decision today, and you'll be saved. Well, today from the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, we've learned this truth, that through the sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, believers find their ultimate security in Christ. So before we close our time together, my mind goes back to that Svalbard Global Seed Vault, and because I'm a visual guy, I wanted to give us um, an opportunity to see what this what this vault actually looked like. Um, from These pictures come from the actual website. I've got the link right below the picture there. Uh, but here's a picture of the seeds that have been strategically stored inside of this 11,000 square foot facility. And uh, if you go on their website, you'll find that they have in this vault 1,214,827 different seed samples from when I last checked it. And those seed samples, as we mentioned earlier, have been locked away from the world inside of this vault right here. It looks like something out of a science fiction movie, but there's that vault. And these pictures, they bear testimony to the simple fact that those seeds have been locked away safely and securely, never probably to see the light of day again. Now, even though this structure is impressive, we need to remember that this is the work of man. What we have up here is the work of man. But what we have been studying today, this sealing ministry of the Holy Spirit, that is a work of God. That is a work of God. No one you cannot lose your salvation. I am convinced of that fact based upon this ministry of the Holy Spirit that we have looked at here today. Let me close in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we go through your week as your people, we would take time this week to thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us. Some of those blessings we do not feel. Some of those blessings we might not even know exist. One of them here is a sealing ministry. I pray that we would thank you for the sealing ministry this week, that we would take time and that we would rest on, that we would faith rest on the promises that you've given to us. We want to give you praise and we thank you for that. Thanks for our time together and for anyone listening today who has never made that decision to trust Christ. The stakes are high. Scripture says that there, are, there will be one of two places where someone will go to spend eternity, either in heaven with the Lord or in hell for eternity. And Lord, if someone has never made that decision listening to this, to trust Christ, Christ alone apart from their own works, I pray that they would make that decision in this moment now. And we will thank you for that. In your name I pray. Amen.